which happens to be probably the area most prone to hurricanes in the whole of the North Atlantic and Galway region. Um, here there have been over 80 tropical cyclones which struck the state since 1950, significantly more than the second most hit area which is of course Cuba. Um, during this week's feature we will discover just how and why tropical cyclones form around the world and put the North Atlantic Basin, as you can see behind me, the Gulf of Mexico in particular here, firmly under the microscope as we take a look at historic storms and much more besides to keep you entertained. Um, any questions during this week can be directed to Force 13 social pages which are on your screen now or alternatively through the website or email also on your screen right now um, and I'll answer them at the end of the week. Those of you who don't know much about cyclones but are enthusiastic to learn more out of interest, fascination or necessity will hopefully get a lot out of this week's series. And those who have been following Force 13 and cyclone activity for a while may learn a new thing or two throughout the week. We'll also be looking at particular devastating storms and delving deep into how they came to be and how they caused such an impact that they did. This being illustrated by video footage from Tropmex Michael Lacker and other media from authorities. Here's the schedule for this week, showing exactly what we'll be covering. Today we'll be exploring just how tropical cyclones form. Coming into view is Earth, the blue planet, named as such because of the amount of water that is seen on its surface. And this is certainly the first ingredient to create terrestrial cyclones that we're all familiar with. Surrounding the equator is the tropical zone which extends from the Tropic of Cancer at 23 degrees north to the Tropic of Capricorn at 23 degrees south. This is where most tropical storms develop. And now the most common storm development areas from west to east, the eastern Pacific first of all covering Hawaii and the western coast of Mexico and the United States, the North Atlantic and the South Atlantic covering the whole Atlantic region, and on the other side of Africa, the Indian Ocean which has storms um, on both sides of the equator throughout the year, in the southern Indian Ocean affecting Madagascar and Africa and sometimes Australia, and the North Indian Ocean which affects India and other areas around there. The Western Pacific and the South Pacific are also active at their relevant points of the year as well. Throughout the year, storms form in different areas, mainly in the Southern Hemisphere from November to April and then the Northern Hemisphere for the rest of the year, as illustrated by the green areas here on this map. But just how do these storms come to be? The next section of the video will explain that. In the tropical region lies a broad zone of low pressure and thanks to the warm oceanic waters, thundery showers are commonplace around this area as you can see here, but they are not true tropical storms. Sometimes these thunderstorms merge and expand and eventually a centre of circulation becomes apparent in the low pressure system. So what conditions does a storm need to form and develop? Well, first of all, there needs to be sufficient distance from the equator to generate their spin, helped by the Coriolis force, which is a result of Earth's rotation. Next, the storm requires warm sea surface temperatures beneath it to strengthen. The threshold for tropical storms is generally around 26 or 27 degrees Celsius, or 80 degrees Fahrenheit. Vertical wind shear is another factor in a storm's development. A high amount of wind shear can severely disrupt development and distort the storm's structure as seen here with Typhoon Tapper earlier this year. The higher clouds associated with the storm are displaced from its low level circulation and indeed in this example they dissipated completely. Another factor of development is the amount of moisture in the environment around the storm. A dry air environment is not conducive to storm development and if this air interferes with a storm's circulation then it is likely to weaken and possibly dissipate. These are the main factors, there are others too but if the four that have been mentioned are conducive to storm development then in all likelihood that's what we will see. 
If a storm continues to develop and reach sustained wind speeds of over 73 miles per hour, it becomes a hurricane or a typhoon as it is known in the Western Pacific. At this point the storm may begin to develop an eye as you can see here. And then it comes to the next part, landfalls and other storm processes that occur later in its life, as well as how they are classified. That's in tomorrow's video.